All right. Uh, thank you for coming back. I hope uh, more people will come back. But uh, because it's time, I think uh, uh, I will start. So, but uh, start slowly with some uh, mot motivation for for the next part. So, so, so we are in part uh, part three, and we are talking about some uh, Boltzmann machines uh, that can be used for time series uh, modeling or learning. And I've talked about some non-recurrent. Uh, Boltzmann machine or recurrent Boltzmann machines, which can be used for uh, time series uh, modeling. So we have seen that the one problem of this uh, recurrent models for time series is that it needs uh, back propagation through time uh, to uh, back propagation through time, and which is uh, particularly not very suitable when we want to do some kind of online prediction on an online learning for for time time series. So uh, online learning, what we are thinking, uh, uh, we, are, uh, we, have in, uh, we have in mind, it has uh, this kind of uh, uh, structure. So we have these uh, sensors that uh, observe uh, this uh, time series data. And uh, this, uh, at time t, we, we observe this pattern. Uh, that uh, These are the outputs from, from the sensors. And based on this pattern, we want to update our internal state, which may be uh, some uh, RNA internal state. Uh, um, on, and also update the, the model parameter so that we, we can better pre predict the, the ne next pattern. And, 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 and ideally, we want to throw away this uh, observed pattern, and we, it's gonna be it's not gonna be used in in, in the in, in the in, in, uh, in the uh, succeeding steps. And this kind of online learning is needed when when we don't we don't have a sufficient uh, resource to store. These or all of these time time series, or we don't have the time to 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 deal with all of the time time series at, at each step. Maybe uh, you have a huge, uh, very long time series, or you have a very uh, high dimensional time series, or you are learning in a very tiny device, tiny uh, IoT devices. So that's the uh, the, the framework that uh, that we want to apply. So a problem of this uh, recurrent uh, structure is that it needs a back pro 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 propagation through time at each iteration, at each moment of this online learning. So at uh, every time t, we observe a new pattern and update uh, our parameters uh, according to this uh, stochastic gradient. But this uh, step requires back pro pro propagation through time, and this uh, the the, the, com time, the complexity of back propagation through time is is linear with respect to the, the length of the pre pre preceding time series. So it's not quite uh, tractable when you have a long series, a, a long sequence, or when you don't have much time at, 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 the, at each at each moment. And also this uh, the, uh, after you update this uh, parameter, you want to predict the next next pattern. Or next uh, the distribution of the next pattern, but uh, again this part requires uh, uh, linear time with respect, to, with respect to the length of the, the preceding time series because your parameters has been uh, updated. So you don't you, uh, at every moment you change your your parameter theta. So you you, you need to recompute your hidden values, or 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 if you or if you, you are sam sampling hidden hidden values, you need to resample your, your your hidden values to, by by using these new parameters. So to to deal with uh, uh this uh for online learning of, of time time series, we are we are study this model called dynamic Boltzmann machine. So <clears throat> I'm going to start with this uh, original idea of uh, dynamic Boltzmann machines. So it, it's defined uh, at a limit of a sequence of, of Boltzmann machine uh, like this. This uh, Boltzmann, machine, uh, Boltzmann machine has has this structure, which is similar to a uh, conditional uh, RB, uh, conditional uh, RBM. But here, we, so far now, for now, we we, we don't talk about uh, hidden units. That is going to come uh, later in this talk. And, and similar to the idea of, uh, of spiking Boltzmann machine, we assume some uh, parametric, parametric form of, of the weight and let the number of layers tend to uh, infinity and look at the, and study the limit of this sequence of the of, of Boltzmann machines. The particular parametric form we consider is this uh, has this form for the reason that I'm I'm gonna explain later. This is uh, some nice uh, pro property. So in particular, so Wij delta represents uh, the, the weight between uh, x, between xt minus delta to xxt, 
Uh, so this is a unit i and unit j, and they are separate, separated by time, uh, by time the delta. And this weight is represented as a w i i j delta. And uh, by uh, so this, uh, by parametric form, we assume that this has the form of form of this. So u i j is the height of this curve, and lambda is the decay rate of this curve, and uh, and, and, and and so on. So d i j can be seen as a conduction delay from unit i to unit j. So uh, so the, the the impact of the of the, the, the value of, of unit one has the uh, has highest uh, has highest impact after this delay on unit unit j. For the reasons that I explained later, we, we can also assume this 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 weight, which uh, looks looks like this. So v i j is the height of this this height of here, and it decays with rate uh, mu in, in this direction. So by, by assuming this parametric form, we uh, we can we can show that it has a limit which uh, looks like this. It is a dynamical model. So it ha uh, so this figure represents only a connection between two units, so a unit i and unit j. So it may be uh, related to your uh, some uh, neural ne network. So unit i is uh, represents some neuron i, and at each moment it will, it fires or, or not. So it takes a value of one or, or zero. And, and this value travels along this uh, first inverse of Q, so it travels, moves one step, one, one, one at a time. And this part is uh, some uh, connection between neuron I and neuron J, and it is uh, maybe related to a synapse in neural network. And when the, the value reach, reaches the synapse, it affects this, uh, the values that are stored in, uh, in, in, in the synapse. And this quantity is called a synaptic eligibility trace. So when the value one uh, uh, arrives at the synapse, the, this uh, quantity uh, jumps up by a constant amount, and otherwise the value decays by, uh, by a constant factor. Which, uh, so, up, so the update rule looks like, like this. So because uh, this is a limit of a sequence of a Boltzmann machine, we can also talk about a limit of a sequence of energy of the Boltzmann machine, or a limit of a sequence of the, uh, the probability of, of, the, of the Boltzmann machines. And the probability of, of uh, the limit of the probability actually looks uh, like, 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 like this. So this is the, uh, the firing probability of unit i at time t. And it, this, is, uh, uh, this depends on the whole time series uh, with, uh, up to time t minus 1. And it has this uh, simple e expression. And in particular, neuron J is, like, uh, uh, is very likely to fire at time t when the value when uij and alpha ij are both large and, and positive. So alpha ij is this uh, synaptic eligibility trace, and it, it, it represents how recently and how frequently spikes arrived from neuron i to, to neuron j or, or, or the synapse. And if uh, alpha, uh, alpha ij is large, and also a TIJ is large, then a neuron J is very likely to fire in, in, in the next moment. And the UIJ represents the, the connection or the impact of, the, of neuron I to neuron J, and we are learning the strength of, of, of this impact in, in, in our learning procedure. So because we can define uh, this uh, conditional distribution, uh, we, we, can, uh, we, we can maximize the, uh, the log likelihood of this uh, given, given time series by following the gradient. So we just take the gradient uh, with respect to uh, this, uh, each, each parameter, and uh, we find this, uh, the, the, the gradient has, has this form. So it, uh, it uh, implies a stochastic gradient-based uh, method of updating the, the, these parameters of, of uh, of the dynamic Boltzmann machines. So UIJ is the uh, strength of the connection from new, uh, unit I to unit J, and it is updated with this uh, learning rule. So we say that we should uh, increase the value of UIJ when neuron J fires at time t, and this, uh, this uh, value, uh, the amount of the change is, it, it depends on this uh, quantity, uh, synaptic eligibility trace alpha. So if you have, uh, if you recently uh, receive if neuron i if uh, the spikes from neuron i has recently and frequently arrived at neuron j and at that moment neuron j fired then we update uij by by a, bit, uh, by a large amount so it has, it has a connection it, has, it can be uh, compared against the learning rule of Boltzmann machine which uh, looks like this and so there are some similarity and differences that but the similarity is, is that we also have this uh, contrast 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 uh, contrastive term. 
So if we, it is already expected that neuron J fires in, in, the mo in the next moment, we don't update UIJ by so, so much, even if neuron J fires at time, time, time t. And this learning rule has a very uh, much related to uh, what, what, uh, a learning rule called spike timing dependent plasticity. So we have seen that uh, bo uh, the learning rule for both bo Boltzmann machine can be related to uh, uh, gives some theoretical foundation for the he Hebbian learning rule. So Hebbian rule he 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 says that the cells uh, that, uh, that fire together, what, why, what, what, that fire together, what wire together. But uh, this uh, spike uh, SDDB says that uh, this, uh, the amount of change uh, depends on the precise timing of, of these two spikes. And this is the, uh, uh, some uh, results from the, the exper experiments of, from uh, uh, experiments. So the horizontal axis uh, can be seen as the, uh, as the, 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 the difference between the, time, the two, two timings. When, uh, so, so when this uh, horizontal axis is zero, it means that the, the postsynaptic neuron fires immediately after presynaptic neuron. So presynaptic neuron is, uh, after presynaptic neuron fires, a spike travel along, along some, something called ax axon, and then eventually affect the activity of postsynaptic neuron. So if the, the two, uh, the, the, these two, two neuron fire at the same time, then uh, you, the, the amount of the changes that uh, is uh, in, in your the, the strength in, in the connection changes by, by, uh, by a large amount. But if uh, the postsynaptic neuron fires, after a while of uh, the presynaptic neuron fires, then uh, you don't change the, the rate so, so much. This is what represents. And when the, this order is reversed, which means that the postsynaptic neuron fires before presynaptic neuron fires, then we have this re reverse effect that uh, the weight is weakened. Weight between two, two neurons is weakened. So the learning rule of this dynamic Boltzmann machine is very much uh, has some uh, has the key property of this spike timing dependent plasticity. So so alpha ij is uh, represent how recently uh, the pre, pre, pre synaptic neuron fired, and. Uh, we say that uh, when postsynaptic neuron fires, the amount of changes to uij should be proportional to R alpha ij. So I've been explaining only this learning rule, but there is also uh, uh, the, the learning rule for the uh, there are another parameters, and it, it, it can be interpreted as uh, represented this this, uh, this curve. So if a postsynaptic neuron fires before presynaptic neuron fires, then uh, the, the weight is, is weakened. And uh, the amount of changes is uh, depends on the precise timing of the two spikes. Okay. So this is the summary of the, the, the basics of, of the, the dynamic Boltzmann machine. So what is important about this, Boltzmann, this dynamic Boltzmann machine is that the past step complexity of for online prediction and online learning is, is constant. It doesn't depend on the length of the preceding time, uh, preceding time series. And this is in contrast to uh, uh, recurrent models, which require uh, uh, back propagation through time. When it is used in online, on, 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 when it is used in online learning, you have to do back propagation through time at a, a, every step. And exact. So this uh, uh, this learning group is uh, is uh, exact uh, stochastic gradient that maximizes the log likelihood of, of your given time time series, and it has a key property of spike timing dependent plasticity. So the similar to a dynamic Boltzmann machine, which uh, which gives a uh, uh, whose uh, learning rule that is derived based on the maximum likelihood estima estimation as the key property of Hebbian he 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 learning rule. This is a dynamic Boltzmann machine gives some theoretical foundation because its learning rule based on maximum likelihood estimation has some a key pro property of uh, SDDP. And then we have the derived uh, from uh, this the dynamic Boltzmann machine as a, as a formal limit of a sequence of Boltzmann, Boltzmann machines. So that's the uh, uh, our result from uh, to 2015. But uh, so, we, uh, so for the rest of this uh, part three, I want to talk about some extensions uh, of, of this work. So, and these are the, uh, the topics that I'm going to cover for the rest of the part three. So first, uh, we want to give more flexibility to, uh, we wanted to give more flexibility to this the dynamic Boltzmann machine. Because uh, original uh, motivation is, is 
is closely tied to this uh, bi biological uh, or neuroscience uh, perspective of, of giving founda founda theoretical foundation for, for SDTP. And some of the, uh, the, uh, the, the constraints uh, that, that we placed to, to, to give an explanation to SDTP was not quite useful for engineering purpose purposes. So first of all, we have uh, we uh, decided to relax uh, this uh, unshared uh, sh shared parameters uh, in, in, in these regions. So WIG data, ha I say that the WIG data has this uh, shape, uh, parametric form uh, here and here. So it, it is characterized by only by two parameters, UIJ and VIJ. So lambda and, and, and mu are the fi fixed parameters. We, we had some, we, we did some work on. on also learning this uh, decay, decay rate, but uh, exact uh, learning is not quite possible. So there are only two parameters, but it is sort of uh, quite restrictive in, model, in learning very co com complex time series. So we decided to uh, unshare the, the parameters within, uh, within this uh, time horizon from zero to DIJ. So the previously, the weight had looked like uh, the so we had this term in, in, our, in our energy. So it had only one uh, parameter, Vij. But uh, after we relax, uh, sharing the weight within this uh, conduct conduction delay here, we, we, got, we have this, this, this term this, uh, in, in, our, in our energy function. So now we have D, 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 D uh, parameters, Wij delta, from, for, for delta to one, from one to D minus one. So uh, after this uh, relaxation, we get uh, this model uh, where the energy function uh, can be represented with this uh, concise form with a uh, vector and matrix uh, notations. So we still have this. Uh, so this uh, this is quite, quite uh, yeah. So we have this uh, uh, bias term and this uh, linear term, which is uh, obtained by uh, uh, sharing uh, the, the weight. And we also have the term that it depends on our synaptic eligibility trace. So, so this term uh, re represents some uh, so short term de dependency which between a uh, short term uh, dependency in, in your time time series and this term uh, represents your long term dependency in, in your time series. So by uh, using some various uh, decay rates, we, we, we can actually represent some uh, long term de dependency. So with this uh, flexible representation of a dy dynamic Boltzmann machine, our learning rule uh, uh, look, looks like this. It can be represented constantly in vector matrix uh, uh, representations. So these are the uh, learning rules for bias and, and weight, uh, uh, and which uh, looks like this. So uh, and this expected value, which has been intractable in, in many uh, 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 energy-based model. It, it is, uh, in fact, it is uh, tractable for that dynamic Boltzmann machine, and uh, this expected value uh, can, can be represented like this, where m is a vector. Uh, so, so this part is, uh, the operation is element-wise, and um, vector m has uh, this ex expression. So, <clears throat> so it can be, uh, uh, so this uh, model can, can, can be uh, still, uh, Update so this updated loop can still is still independent of the total length of the, your, your your time series, so, so which is in contrast to the back propagation through time uh, algorithms. Okay, uh, so it might be also be uh, quite uh, restrictive that our energy function is linear with respect to uh, input input values, uh, which was uh, like this. Uh, our, our energy function was uh, linear with respect to these input values and, and the parameters. So it might be uh, quite uh, restrictive, but uh, we, we can always create some nonlinear features using uh, other methods. So in, in this particular work, we used an uh, uh, echo state ne network to create a nonlinear feature from a given input and, and using this uh, procedure. And, and then these uh, output uh, features that are created recursively using this uh, nonlinear mapping is used together with uh, uh, um, input. So it is also uh, easy to extend it's that time, time both machines to deal with uh, real valued data. And we, uh, so I'm going to first talk about this Gaussian DBM, which is uh, which can be uh, used to represent uh, 
uh, really value the data, and, and then to a fun functional uh, the IBM, which is a uh, Okay, which can also be which can also represent a real valued data, but it is on continuous uh, continuous space. So if you uh, define an uh, energy function like this, so it is uh, actually a sim it has a similar form to uh, the, the previous uh, the dynamic Boltzmann machine's uh, energy form. You, you, you can you, you can find that the conditional probability density of, of each unit uh, looks. Like, like this. So empty is uh, is the expression that we have seen in the, the standard dynamic Boltzmann machines, but uh, so it has so its conditional dis uh, probability, probability distribution is Gaussian, where the mean is given by by this uh, expression, which is uh, this expression has appeared in the uh, the energy expression of the standard or uh, binary binary dynamic Boltzmann machine. And the learning load for this Gaussian dynamic Boltzmann thing is uh, can, can be derived based on natural gradient or some uh, standard uh, gradient. But if you take the natural gradient, uh, it uh, looks like this. So it's uh, very similar to the, to the case of uh, the binary dynamic Boltzmann thing. The only 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 difference is that this uh, expected value is changed to m, and m it, it has it has this form. So it is of course same. Uh, uh, very similar to a vector auto regression. So if if, if so, this because uh, mt is going to be given as your uh, standard uh, pr pr prediction. If your prediction is like uh, is 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 uh, expected uh, values, then this these are the pr pr uh, your your prediction. And this is a, uh, if if you don't have this term, it is uh, it is the same as a vector auto regression. But uh, but we uh, we try to uh, you. you because, uh, but we include this uh, term that depends on this uh, LGBT trace, and we uh, we learn the parameters in an online manner. And this uh, Gaussian uh, dynamic boats machine can be extended to uh, 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 to deal with uh, to define uh, the functional to extend it to uh, the pa pa functional patterns on, on continuous uh, continuous space. Sorry. So, so this is uh, this is uh, this work is going to be uh, presented in in this conference. Uh, I think it's uh, Tuesday, right? Uh, uh, this this is the paper number. So, at each moment, you have uh, this uh, continuous uh, patterns in in your uh, continuous space, and. Uh, you are given as an input. You cannot observe all, all of the uh, the part, all, all the values in continuous space. So you have a finite number of uh, sensors, and maybe the number of sensors changes over time, and the location of the sensors may, may change. And so you have a finite number. You have an observation of, of, the, of this pattern from far finite points. And then you want, what you want to predict predict is the, the distribution of, of the ne next pattern. But this pattern is uh, the continuous pattern. So the, this Gaussian dynamic Boltzmann machine can be uh, can be uh, can be uh, can be extended to to deal with this kind of a con continuous pattern or, or time series of this con continuous pattern. So the similar to the uh, Gaussian IBM, we represent uh, the mean and in covariance. And it, in this case, covariance is fixed. Covariance between uh, the value of point at z and co uh, value between uh, value at point z z prime. So the, the mean value at of, of point Z is uh, has, has this, can, can be written as this. So this is a bit, uh, bias term, uh, bias of point at, at point Z. And uh, we have this uh, term, so which represents the weight from uh, point Z at end point Z, and, and, and the time is separated by time, time delta. So this is uh, your observation at time T minus delta at, at point Z, Z prime. And this is uh, this term corresponds to your a, a, the eligibility trace in the case of binary dynamic Boltzmann machine, but defined for your your continuous space. This is the eligibility trace at 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 point z z prime. And this uh, the weight term represent how this uh, value in the in the next moment at at point z is related to the point at uh, the, the value of the eligibility trace at point. Z, Z prime. 
because this expression involves an uh, integral and in integral in particular, and, and it is defined for continuous space, it is a uh, computationally intractable. So you need to assume some, some kind of parametric form. And these, these are the forms that are assumed in, in, in the paper. So, so first of all, we prepare, we prepare a set of arbitrarily selected points, P. So this is a finite number of points, um, and it is uh, fixed, and uh, let me, uh, randomly chosen, uh, typically. So this uh, bias at, at point Z can be represented uh, as this. So this is this K, so this is uh, our covariance matrix, but, uh, and this is uh, defined as a vector, where, which represents the, the covariance between uh, Z and, and each point in, in P. So this is a, a, a row vector. So this is an inner, inner product between this row vector and this column, column vector, and, and this is how this uh, bias is, uh, is, uh, is defined. We can also define uh, this uh, the weight, uh, this uh, weight functions using this uh, covariance matrix and uh, and it is uh, uh, matrix in this way. So, uh, so again, this is a, a row vector and this is a column ve vector. So learning in in this case uh, can can be written uh, like, like this. So, for example, the, the, the bias term, bias vector that is used to, uh, in, in this parametric form can be up, updated with, with this up procedure. <coughs> okay, so, uh, so finally, I, I wanted to talk about some uh, dynamic bottom machine when it has uh, hidden units. So we have uh, presented this uh, work uh, two weeks ago at ICML in Sydney. So uh, so, far, so far we haven't talked about uh, uh, hidden units. We have just, we just had uh, um, visible units. So but uh, we can also talk about this uh, dynamic board Boltzmann machine which has this uh, hidden unit. But we have seen that uh, learning this model is is difficult in the case of like a uh, spiking Boltzmann machine or or temporal uh, restricted Boltzmann machine. So we're gonna see why this is difficult and uh, and, 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 and seek a, a way to learn this, this, this model. So it turns out that this, uh, this the prob probability of, of this, uh, the defined by this uh, dynamic Boltzmann machine with hi hidden units can be, uh, can be re represented like this. So the distribution of the, the next visible pattern depends on your previous uh, patterns of uh, previous, previous pattern of visible values and hid, hidden values. And, but hidden values are also uh, random, random variables, so we need to take into account the distribution of hi, hidden values, uh, which, is, uh, which can depend on the, the values of your observed, observed values. So the distribution of this uh, visible uh, unit uh, looks uh, can be can be re represented like, like this using conditional expected uh, con conditional uh, energy, which has uh, this uh, expression, and the hidden distribution has also uh, an analogous analogous uh, uh, representation. So we use uh, theta to represent uh, the parameters associated with uh, this distribution. Uh, this conditional distribution, and you use phi to uh, to represent the parameters that is associated with uh, this distribution. So we first uh, consider the, the how we learn this uh, parameter theta. It turns out that it, this uh, learning this uh, parameter theta is sort of intractable without any uh, approximations. But here in this for for for, for parameter theta, we, we can apply uh, the standard standard uh, technique of uh, using Jensen's equality and, and maximizing this uh, lower bound. So this uh, lower bound uh, has an expression of uh, that uh, it is an expected value of this uh, log uh, probability. So you, you can use uh, because it's an expe expected value of, of expected value of, of, of something. You can uh, you can use a stochastic gradient me method. First, uh, you sample uh, uh, hidden values according to uh, this, this distribution, and then update the parameter according to this uh, stochastic gradient. It turns out that this is the same as the this this learning rule is the same 
but the landing load without a hidden unit. So the only change is that instead of just having this uh, observed values, you also have hidden values. I think we need this uh, uh, less than t, t sign here. So, uh, so your, your next pattern depends on your, your pre previous pattern and pre previous sampled hidden values. So sampled hidden values are used as input, but except that uh, the learning rule is the same as the case when we have only uh, visible values. But it turns out that the learning, the, the, the parameters that are associated with the conditional distribution of a hidden values is much more uh, difficult. If, if you take the gradient of this lower bound, uh, you get this expression, which uh, has uh, another uh, summation here and uh, another uh, factor that didn't appear in, in the previous expression. So if you are, want to apply a stochastic gradient method, it still, look, it still has an expression that it is an expected value of, of something. So you can still apply a stochastic gradient method. But if you do so, you need to do a sampling a hidden values according to this. But you need to, instead of taking the next hidden values, you need to take the hidden values for, for, from time zero to all, 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 all the way to the time t minus one. And use these sample values to and and do some some kind of summation and 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 then apply apply this uh learning rule. So this is uh, unfortunately it takes a uh, linear time because you you cannot re uh, reuse the sample values because in this case you your file is up updated at every step, and you need this summation which is uh, uh over linear number of uh, terms. So the technique that we have uh, proposed in this uh, ICML paper is this uh, bi-directional learning. <clears throat> so the uh, idea is to, to use, uh, so this is the uh, our orig original dynamic Boltzmann machine, which has this uh, visible values and hidden values, we, and we try to uh, predict the next values depending on the, your, your historical values. But you can also use this uh, dynamic Boltzmann machine to define this backward, uh, backward, backward model. So, and you can do this backward learning. So you are given, now you are given a few future values and try to predict the past values. So what is uh, the key point here is that patterns that are difficult, easy to learn in forward learning and easy to learn in backward learning. And these parameters are complementary to, to each other. So for example, so in the case of forward learning, these parameters V, W, B are e easy to learn. So you can apply just, you can just maximize the lower bound of, of your uh, log-like rule. But in the case of backward learning, these parameters U, W, and V are the, the, the parameters that are easy to learn. So, the, so U is the, the parameters that are difficult to learn in forward learning, but it is easy to learn in, in backward learning. So by applying both forward learning and, and backward learning, we can we can learn V, W, B, and, and U. And U what's the, the difficult uh, parameter to learn. Okay, uh, so so here I'm I've summarized uh, the, uh, the, the part, what, what we have covered in part three. So we have, first we have seen that we, we can we can do some kind of discriminative learning with both machine for time, time series learning. It is uh, discriminative learning because because we are we are learning the conditional distribution of the next pattern given the, your, your pre previous uh, patterns. We have also talked about online learning for time series using uh, dynamic Boltzmann machines. And uh, the key property of the dynamic Boltzmann machine is that its learning rule is, uh, is constant. It doesn't, it's independent of the, of the length of the time series. And we have seen that, we have, that it has, its learning rule has a connection or relations or giving theoretical foundation to a spike timing independent plasticity, which is known in new neuroscience. So a key problem that uh, frequently appear in uh, uh, recurrent, uh, recurrent hidden units that, uh, is that it is uh, difficult to learn the parameters associated with, with hidden, hidden units. So, so some uh, so solution to, to this is that is to use non-recurrent models like a conditional uh, LBM or, or use a deterministic, value, uh, deterministic values for hidden units uh, same, like, like uh, uh, recurrent temporal 
uh, RBM and do back propagation through time, or we can do uh, by by directional learning in the case of the Boltzmann machines. And uh, it is uh, so uh, our observation uh, that we can uh, see from, from this uh, uh, this part is that it is good to combine various, various models. For example, combining RBM and RBM. To, so that you, you get a best uh, time series model suitable for your particular uh, applications. Okay, so now questions, and we want to switch to our part four. Yes. So, so in terms of uh, model performance, how is this uh, uh, tied uh, uh, compared hmm. with other neural network yes. models? Yeah. yeah. So we compared. Uh, so. Obviously, so if it applies to your online learning, it's uh, that IBM has a constant uh, time uh, com complexity, so that the, the learning time is has, has a, so IBM has an advantage of uh, uh, efficiency in, in, in learning. And if you want to do, if you have uh, the time for batch learning or offline learning, I, I think uh, so. The bottom machine is simpler than LSTM, so LSTM has a better chance of uh, learning a, a better quality. But when it is applied to uh, uh, online learning, uh, LSTM is not quite, quite suitable for online learning. So if if both are applied to online learning, predictive accuracy is also like a comparable. It depends on which uh, data you, you apply. Okay, so now we'll uh, kind of change gears. So, by the way, please uh, ask uh, questions in between. So if you have doubts, just uh, stop me in the middle and ask a question. So till now, we kind of concentrated on uh, generative modeling uh, in the first part and second part. And then, um, oh, it's not coming. Uh, in the third part, uh, we looked at how to use these um, energy-based models uh, for um, kind of time series learning and so now we will be essentially move to towards a completely uh, so not completely but slightly different domain of uh, reinforcement learning uh, using these kind of energy based models as function approximators so here I'm just summarizing that so we have covered this so far a generative model of our data using these energy based models we have also seen that when we have a continuous or, or sequential data or temporal stream of uh, say sensory data, we can use these energy based models like uh, restricted uh, temporal Boltzmann machines or dynamic Boltzmann machines and its variants in order to make an online prediction of what you expect to see in the next future time step. Uh, another very interesting domain is of sequential decision making. So in this kind of uh, problem setting, we not only want to make a prediction of what we want to see in the future, but we want to make act upon those predictions. So how do you, so for example, if you have a self-driving car or you have this uh, simulation where you're learning to drive a car, you typically not only want to predict what you expect to see in the future or do in the future, but you, so you want to predict what you, how, how you can act based on those predictions or a simple s setup like a carpool balancing problem. And typically in these scenarios, you, your future outcome or the final outcome depends on a series of actions. So you sequentially are taking a, a series of actions with the objective that you want to maximize uh, some form of uh, final goal. And this is given in the form of rewards. Uh, and these rewards are essentially evaluative feedback that tells your agent or the system that the actions that you're performing are good or bad. Right? So how do you act in this kind of a sequential decision making problem is what we're going to solve using reinforcement learning. So typically, this is basically a primer on very basic primer or reinforcement learning. So if uh, any of you were there during yesterday's tutorial given by Igor on uh, deep reinforcement learning, that should also be a very sufficient background on reinforcement learning as well. But I'll kind of cover some uh, initial aspects or details of what reinforcement learning is. So typically, reinforcement learning can be represented using this kind of a Markov decision process. You have some environment using uh, from which we can observe our states 
and the agent essentially acts uh, using some so actions. So these actions, so essentially everything is occurring at every point in time. So you're taking sequential actions. That action will change your environmental state and then you get a feedback from the environment. So essentially you move on to a new state SFT plus one and the environment will also give you some form of reward. And this reward is basically what we, so we want to learn a policy over time typically represented by the representation pi of s, so the policy over your states s, uh, which essentially optimizes uh, the expected return over time. So starting from some initial state say s0, we want to maximize our expected return over time, or in other words, get as much reward as possible as time goes forward. Okay. So one of, uh, very intuitive understanding of this kind of reinforcement learning problem which has been applied successfully in many uh, uh, real world applications. So of course many of you are probably aware of Atari and other games which are quite famous but th there are many real world applications where reinforcement learning is applied and one such is for example elevator control and this apparently seems quite easy. However, for example, if you consider concurrent actions, say each elevator takes three actions moving up, down or staying at the same level and you have 10 different elevators in the building, this becomes quite a large uh, action space. So you would have typically three to the power of 10 actions to deal with. Dynamics is basically what the environment encapsulates. They, so you can either have a model of the environment dynamics or you can also learn in a model free manner. So typical, for example, one form of uh, assumption can be that this dynamics is random. So it comes from some kind of uh, Poisson uh, distribution of arrival time and in this application what you want to do eventually is uh, basically minimize the net waiting time. So be able to predict the future arrival times which kind of optimizes your elevator such that at any given point in time you don't, you don't have to wait for a long period of time in order to get an elevator after you press the button. You can also have constraints. So you don't typically want that if an elevator is moving in the upward direction suddenly it decides to go in the opposite direction in order to uh, kind of achieve this objective function and that also makes uh, reinforcement learning complicated. So typically as I've shown in this example the problems or scenarios in which you can apply reinforcement learning is wherein you need to make uh, a sequence sequential decision. So basically you have a trajectory uh, of or sequence of actions that you will you need to take and those are problems in which you can apply reinforcement learning. Uh, typically you observe either a, a partial or noisy feedback of your states and action choices. So in a typical Markov decision process, you observe, you, you assume that you have a fully observable state space. That means at any given point in time, you can fully observe the entire state space. But it is in real world scenarios, it is also possible or typically it is that you don't have full access to the entire state space and you'll get some noisy estimate of your uh, environment. Uh, that is called partial or noisy, which makes reinforcement learning again uh, difficult and typically you would require memory of your past actions and states in order to uh, predict uh, what is the next action that you should uh, take such that you over time maximize your uh, expected return. And what we want to do is optimize a sequence of actions with this global objective function. Typically the pain points as I talked about are working or dealing with high dimensional state and action spaces. So for example, if you're playing a game of Atari, you typically don't have a very high action space because for example, joystick control, you have a few number of joystick control that you would do, but you can have a very large uh, state space. So for example, uh, dealing directly from pixel data, but there can be also problems in which you have a very large number of action spaces. Uh, for example, continuous control problems, uh, uh, you know, typically deal with that. So if you have a robotics application, you not only you could not only have a high dimensional state space, but you could also have a high uh, dimensional action space that you need to deal with in order to learn an optimal policy of controlling your robot. And as I said, also partial observability is a problem. So typically in reinforcement learning, uh, an RL agent uh, includes more of these components. Uh, so I, I will not go into the details of these in in general, but typically you have, you can either have a combination of all of them or at least one of them. So you would have a policy which essentially tells you the agent's behavior. Uh, and this is represented by pi. So pi of state and action tells you what is the action or what is the policy that your agent is going to follow. 
you will have a value function which essentially tells you uh, a goodness or badness of the actions of your uh, of your policy so how good is each state and or action typically represented by a value function v of pi of s or represented by q where q represents the action value function so not only an estimate of how good is each state but it can be a representation of how good is your state and action you may also have some model of your environment so this model basically tells you uh, some notion of transition so the probability of being in the next state given your past state and action typically if you have access to this model it falls under category of model based reinforcement learning which works slightly better however learning this model is difficult uh, what we are going to look at today are largely model free reinforcement learning methods where we don't have access to this kind of a model of the environment or model of the dynamics of the environment so another primer on so the value of this policy and control uh, typically can be formulated using a dynamic programming approach given by these two well known bellman uh, equations so the first one is basically a bellman equation for state value function given some fixed policy so pi here is the fixed policy so the value function associated with this policy pi at state s so how good your state is can be given by summing over all the actions so a here represents all the actions say say in this case you have discrete actions so all possible actions r is the immediate reward that you get being in state s and a and gamma is a discount factor so what you're doing is that you're discounting future rewards over time t is essentially uh, a bellman operator which gives you this expectation and v of pi is the value function associated with your next state s prime this can also be formulated in the form of a state action value function so now you not only find out how good is your so the value associated with each state but you can also find out the value associated with each state and action and that has a similar representation so this is represented as the reward at state uh, so, so reward that you get being at state s and action a uh, plus gamma being again the discount factor summing over all possible states s prime given this transition function so this p tells you what is the probability of being in state s prime uh, given uh, the previous state s and a and then you take an arg max so you are choosing so the maximum action associate so the action associated with the maximum value function uh, or action value function out here so these two can be applied so typically you don't have ac access to this uh, uh, transition function or the probability function if you have access to this probability function you can solve this without actually doing the full reinforcement le learning problem so you can use dynamic programming approach uh, at, that means you can start from some random pi so you choose some random policy uh, then you evaluate this policy so, and, so you evaluate this policy using basically this kind of Bellman operation so that can be applied recursively and you at every point in time based on this Q you just act greedily so you take this arg max uh, and choose the maximum uh, action so the action associated with this maximum Q and act greedily and it can be shown that if you do this uh, process repeatedly you are uh, basically going to reach the optimal policy pi star uh, corresponding to also the optimal uh, value function v star uh, so basically this equation which is comes from the bellman expectation equation uh, for uh, an optimal policy pi star can be written in a similar form uh, to get you the bellman optimality equation typically we don't have access to so we don't have this uh, uh, probability function so now we are going to see some uh, methods that can be applied uh, using model free reinforcement learning one such method is basically called sarsa or temporal difference learning for a fully observable scenario so once again we are uh, assuming here uh, in this formulation that you have uh, essentially full observability of your uh, markov decision process so what you do is that you evaluate a policy by iteratively updating the action value function q using this formulation so wherein the action value function at state at time t and action at time t depends on is updated using this wherein this term gives you the expected return uh, by taking this action at time t plus one and being in state t plus one so by taking this one step action what is the expected return that you get subtracted from your previous expectation expectation of your value function 
So typically, this is an approximation of your, uh, uh, so it can be viewed as a Monte Carlo approximation of the Bellman equation. So if you just have a Monte Carlo update of your Bellman equation, instead of this, you would have the actual reward uh, at, at, at this t plus one step. So by taking this t plus one step, you know if you have, you know your actual reward, you can just subtract that. However, this formulation gives you, uh, so this is also known as a temporal difference uh, algorithm, which gives, uh, lets you deal with delayed reward scenarios much more better. Okay. So the term SARSA comes from the fact that you have at every point in time, you take into the account your previous state, action, the next reward, the next state and the next action into account in order to update this equation. And that's the reason it's basically called SARSA. You may be familiar with Q learning. Uh, in Q learning, it's a very similar representation, except that this is an on policy method. So meaning that you would have, you take the next action A of T plus one and then evaluate your Q, fu Q function, but do not act, you do not take the arg max. You do not consider the uh, action associated with the maximum Q value. In case of Q learning, you would act in an off policy manner. So you don't take into account A of T plus one, for, you, in this case, you would have the same equation, but in this term, you would have an arg max. So you take the uh, action associated with the maximum Q value function in order to update your Q value. And there are some differences between SARSA and Q, Q, Q learning. Okay. What we want to do now is use some form of fun function approximation. So why, why have we been talking about this reinforcement learning and this energy-based uh, machine learning tutorial is now we are going to use some form of function approximator to approximate our Q function, Q action value function. And energy-based models gives us such one suitable uh, function approximator. So typically, if you use uh, some uh, approximation, so for example, so the action value function parameterized by some parameters theta, you can use some kind of a linear function approximator. So your phi, phi are, are your features and theta is basically the parameters of the model. And with this kind of a linear function approximator, there are some very nice proofs that you can show that your learning will always converge to a, a, a good policy. So it will converge without divergence. However, if you have nonlinear function approximator, such convergence is not guaranteed. Uh, or in other words, th there are divergence issues. Such divergence, by the way, is more prone in case of Q learning. So instead of SASA, if you use a nonlinear function approximator, like a very deep neural network, and approximate a Q action value function, it is also very prone to divergence, more so as compared to SASA. That's something to keep in mind. Of course, this now gives us a function approximator. So now we can use some suitable form of function, function approximator to approximate our Q action value function. So for example, uh, just a, uh, a linear, uh, function approximator, but we also need some notion of policy. So the policy is basically what tells us how should we act based on this uh, Q action value function. So one thing of course you can do is that you can act greedily. So if you act, use a greedy uh, policy, then you basically choose uh, the action associated with the maximum uh, Q value function at every point in time, so arg max. Or you can use something that we'll see today is a stochastic policy. And in this case, you have a familiar fo forms. If you have already realized, you would have seen this previously. So this is basically like a softmax uh, policy. So you have an exponential of your uh, Q action value function divided by a normalization term, which is basically summing over all the actions. So here A tilde consists all possible actions. And again, the same uh, e uh, EXP of your um, action value function associated with these A tilde actions. Tau here is basically a temperature parameter or inverse temperature parameter of your Boltzmann uh, distribution. Okay. So how do we actually use energy-based models for such a uh, function approximator for this kind of a SASA learning update? So there is a hi historical work. So the earliest work that introduced such form of energy-based learning for uh, so energy-based reinforcement learning was with the work from Salins and Hinton in 2004 called free energy SASA. So in this work, what they did is that they use a restricted Boltzmann machine's free energy. So recall that the free energy is basically uh, your, you have a linear sum over the hiddens and that gives you the same representation. So this uh, free energy gives you a representation of this form and this uh, representation is used as your policy. So now we are going to approximate 
the Q action value function using the negative free energy of our restricted Boltzmann machine. In order to do that, we have the same restricted Boltzmann machine, but we are going to consider that the visible nodes are divided into state variables and action variables, right? So say you have binary states and you have binary actions. I'm sorry. Some of those represents the states and the others represent the actions. Okay. The policy is going to be a Boltzmann exploration policy uh, as I showed in the previous slide, where you again have e to the power of this energy function with some temperature parameter divided by this partition function or normalization function. This is again summing over all possible actions, which is uh, typically uh, again untractable in case of restricted Boltzmann machines. The parameters, so, so of course what we want to do is we want to update the parameters of these restricted Boltzmann machines uh, using this form of Sasa learning. So by the way, one thing to remember is that because this free energy term is a nonlinear function, this now is a nonlinear Sasa update. So in this case, your Sasa update is approximating this Q action value function using a, a nonlinear function approximator. So similar to what we saw out here, at every point in time, you will update something called the error or the temporal difference error. So the temporal difference error at time t is given by the reward at the next time step t plus 1 subtracted from the discounted factor multiplied by your q action value function. So this was the term out here. So this, so this, so what we are doing is we are calculating this error term and this q action value function is approximated by the minus free energy and that's the reason you have this f term out here par parameterized by theta plus the previous a Q action value function, so which is again the free energy associated with state S of T and A of T. What we want to do is basically update our parameters theta T plus 1 using the gradient information which uh, comes out to be ha having this form. So every point in time you update the parameters theta using some learning rate eta. So eta at time t is basically your learning rate at time t multiplied by this temporal difference error and the gradient of the free energy with respect to these parameters theta t. One thing to remember in practice is that you would want to use uh, uh, eta t term. That is, in order to learn this model better, if you use a fixed learning rate, it typically doesn't work very well. So you would want to kind of start with a higher, higher learning rate and kind of slowly reduce that using some form of hyperbolic discounting, for example, to reduce that uh, learning rate over time. The caveats of this method is that it is prone to divergence, as I mentioned mainly because of the fact that you're using a nonlinear function approximator and this was shown already in the early works of Siklis and Van Roy in 1997. And the second thing is that the RBM model of course does not have any form of uh, memory. So because it does not have memory terms, it typically is not suitable for dealing with partially observable scenarios. So this formulation is uh, basically designed for a fully observable Markov decision process. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. So there have been some few extensions uh, of the free energy SASA uh, work. So one such extension has been to use a scale free energy SASA term. So wherein you have a very simple formulation. So in this work, they proposed that the performance and, uh, can be improved by scaling the free energy by a constant uh, scaling factor Z. So very simple term. So what you did is that you, you have the original Q of at time t which was being approximated by the free energy at time t all that he did is that you now scaled it by z so z is not the partition function so don't confuse it by the previous z z here is just some constant factor related to the size of the Boltzmann machine so a very heuristic approach but they showed that it works very well in practice so no real theoretical motivation why that works other uh, extension has been to use expect energy. So if, if you recall from uh, the morning's talk, so the uh, talk on part one, so we talked about expected energy. So this free energy can be, so negative free energy can be written out as minus of the expected energy plus some entropy term. And in this work, they suggested that instead of using the negative free energy as your function approximator, you can use the negative expected energy as your function approximator directly. And what it does is that this, so we have seen this uh, uh, previously somewhat. So your expected energy uh, is not 
monotonically increasing. So free energy is a monotonically increasing function, whereas your expected energy has a fixed point at around minus 1.28. And the idea being, so by the way, this curve shows that uh, how your um, the hidden uh, activation associated with some node k uh, varies with uh, x of k. And so the idea is that in the old case, if you have a negative uh, uh, hidden activation, so the only way to compensate for that would be to uh, introduce uh, a compensatory bias term, whereas in this case, you don't have to deal with this. Uh, once again, they showed that using expected energy with SARSA and combining that with this form of normalization. So again, you know, you have expected energy, but also you normalize it with some constant term Z. It achieves much better performance as compared to free energy SARSA. Also, one side note to remember is that though the original free energy SARSA does not work with POMDP uh, models, there has been at least one work that I know of wherein they have combined this free energy SARSA. So you have an RBM network, which is and whose free energy you are using to approximate a q-action value function and then you add an additional recurrent neural network in order to deal with uh, partially observable scenarios. So this RNN gives you a memory of your past states and actions given your next state. Okay. So here's just one example of a comparison of the different flavors of free energy SASA. So in this task, uh, it is essentially a simple grid world. So you have a grid world wherein at every point in time, the task is that starting from location one here, you want to reach the center point uh, given by five. Uh, you have an additional task that you, you have either MNIST images. So each uh, location on the grid is associated with an MNIST image or an inverted MNIST image, which basically just inverts the, uh, the uh, the black and whites out here, or you also have a, uh, a CIFR 10 data. So in this case, instead of MNIST, you have uh, images randomly selected from the CIFR 10 data associated with each of these uh, grids locations. The idea is that you want to learn, so only this counterclockwise direction will give you maximum reward, all other directions do not give you reward. So you want to learn this counterclockwise direction of going from 1, 2, 3, 6, 9, 8, 7, 4, and 5. Uh, in CIFR 10 data, starting from this jet image, going to uh, the deer. So this learned quite uh, well using uh, free energy uh, approx function approximation for your q-action value function. And as you can see is that the, even a linear uh, function approximator, so in this case, even if you have a, a simple linear function of, uh, approximator, it works quite well as compared to the other methods. NN represents a neural network. So they compared not, not just RBM based reinforcement learning, but also using a neural network. So basically a two layered neural network as a function approximator. However, if you use this expected uh, free energy, so here EERL is the expected uh, energy term that we talked about. Uh, ZM basically means you are, you not only have the expected energy, but you're also normalizing it with some constant factor that gave much better performance as compared to the other methods. But again, a heuristic uh, method of showing that uh, these extensions of free energy based SASA works quite well in practice. Okay. So with that, I will come to a, a new form of algorithm called uh, DISARSA or D dynamic Bolson machine energy based SARS algorithm. So till now, what we have done is that we have seen that the original dynamic Bolson machine uh, is essentially a generative model of your time series data that maximizes the log likelihood of your time series with which we can do uh, prediction, generation and classification. And we saw that in the last uh, talk. And we saw that you can not only have the original DIBM dealing with binary data, but you can also have extensions in the form of Gaussian dynamic Boltzmann machine or functional dynamic Boltzmann machine that allow you to deal with the real value data and make predictions. What we are now going to do is that we are going to use the energy associated with this dynamic Boltzmann machine as the function approximator of our action uh, value function Q. And because this dynamic Boltzmann machine inherently is a memory based model. So if you recall, it has access to eligibility traces 
and a FIFO queue that allows you that allows you to essentially learn the probability of being in the state at time t given your entire past. You can use this kind of dynamic Boltzmann machine to deal with uh, partially observable decision making problems without using any additional recurrent neural network. So this is a recall slide. Hopefully you still remember, but just to go back again. So this uh, dynamic Boltzmann machine can be represented as a tiered order Markov model. So at every point in time, you, the next value is given by x of t. So there are no hidden variables. All of these are observed. So uh, the energy function can be written in this form. So the energy associated with x at time t given the entire pass. So colon t minus 1 is basically our notation for showing that you have access to the entire uh, t infinite past of all your uh, values can be written out in this form. So the energy again is here, the u is the weight associated uh, with uh, i and j terms. So x at time t connected with x at time t minus delta. Uh, v are basically the uh, weights associated in the negative direction. So if you recall, so we had talked about this STDP curve. So u is the weight which learns long term potentiations, the positive direction weights and v are the weights which learns in the opposite directions, the negative direction weights. Alpha and beta, if you recall, are the eligibility traces. So alpha is basically uh, the trace of how long it has been, so, so how much of memory you have of the activation from your, uh, the past of x of i that influences your x of j. Similarly for beta and gamma. And these eligibility traces is basically what gives us access to our historical information, which we are going to make use to deal with pound dp problems. Okay. And another important distinction is that unlike the free energy in restricted Boltzmann machine, this dibm energy is a linear function, right? So here, this linear function actually gives us quite nice things because if we use this, uh, so if we use the dibm energy as a function approximator for our q action value function. By the fact that it's linear, the convergence guarantees are still maintained, which were violated in the previous case when we were using a nonlinear function approximator. Okay, is that clear? All right. So once again, we go back to our SARSA update rule. So now we are going to evaluate a policy by iteratively updating the action value function Q, which can be again written in this form. Here, H does not represent hidden variables. H represents the history. So the Q action value function given the history at time t and the action at time t. So history basically tells you the past entire past of your previous states and actions is dependent on the Q action value function at time t plus alpha some learning rate multiplied by the temporal difference error, which is basically the reward at time t plus one plus your some discount factor gamma multiplied by the Q action value function that you get by taking this one step ahead. So you're taking the action uh, A of t plus one. Once again, because you're using dynamic Boltzmann machine, you have the entire history of the past actions and observations. So Z here now represents the observation terms. So previously we were calling states, the say because it's a palm dp scenario, uh, instead of states, we, are, we will call them observations. We are going to once again approximate this Q action value function using the dibm energies. Previously, we were using the free energy of RBM, but here we are going to use the energy function of dibm as the function approximator. And it, as we will see, or we have seen in the previous slide, the energy function can be written out as a linear uh, a function of its parameters. So this can be observed out here. So here, essentially, this is nothing but a, a similar representation as phi, so where phi is the features that you're learning and theta is basically the parameters of the dibm network, which would be the bias and the weights. And the policy that we're going to use is basically a Boltzmann exploration policy or a softmax policy. So a stochastic policy being that the probability of getting uh, action A is given by exp, the exponential of your uh, Q action value function divided by this normalization factor. All right. Is it clear so far? Okay. So in Daisasa, this energy of the Boltzmann machine is basically what we are going to use to approximate the Q action value function. Uh, 
In order to do that, similar to RBM, we are going to assume that you have the, op the both the states and the actions are observable, right? So if you just go back a few slides, so even in this case, you had assumed that the visible units can be divided into state variables and action variables. We have the similar thing in case of IBM. So we are assuming that Z here now gives you access to both your states XIs. Uh, so your XI uh, consists of both the observations as well as your actions. So for example, consider a task in which you have say three states and two possible actions. So the total dimensionality of your dynamic Boltzmann machine would be five, that you would have three nodes associated with each of the states and two nodes associated with each of those actions. What we're gonna do is that we're gonna approximate this Q action value function uh, with the energy of dynamic Boltzmann machine associated with the action nodes A at time T. We can choose the probability using this Boltzmann exploration. So the probability of X of J uh, at time t being equals to 1 is equal to 1 by this term. This comes from the fact that you, you are, we are in, in the original model, we are assuming that you have binary actions. So you have binary actions, this energy term becomes 0 because it's multiplied by xj of t and that's the reason you have this nice formulation. Okay, so this is nothing but uh, it's simply coming from here. So this uh, pi is what is represented by the probability term here. So if you just use binary variables, uh, this are binary variables and replace this Q by the energy function of IBM, you will get this formulation. Okay. So once again, what we are going to do is that we want to, of course, update the parameters. So learn the parameters of the model. In case of original dynamic Boltzmann machine, you can recall that we had an update rule, which looks something like this. So you are updating the weights UIJ at every time step. Uh, wherein you would multiply this eligibility trace by xj at time t minus some contrastive term, which is the expectation xj at time t. And this basically, so this alpha ij at time t minus one gives you access to the memory. And this uh, is basically what we motivated from a spike timing dependent plasticity point of view. So this has uh, relationships by uh, to the uh, basically learning in the brain wherein you take into account how long it has been or, or the timing of your spikes or information coming from one presynaptic neuron to postsynaptic neuron is important in order to find the correlations when you would uh, potentiate, that is increase a weight or depress or decrease a weight. Similarly, in Dysarsa, you get this temporal difference error term, which is basically nothing new. So here, all that we have done is that we have replaced the Q action value function by the energy of the IBM. But if you now do this operation, so if you basically do this, if you differentiate this term, that uh, the energy function with respect to the parameters theta, you get a very nice formulation which looks like this. So here we have just shown it for one of the parameters u. So this u now becomes, can be updated. So delta u is basically some learning rate eta at time, temporal difference error delta t multiplied by the eligibility trace and the activation of xj at time t. And this turns out to be something which is known in neuroscience as neuromodulated spike timing dependent plasticity. Essentially the idea being that, that this delta t term behaves similar to something known as dopaminergic neurons in the brain, which encodes the difference between the reward and the expected reward. So if you recall, we had talked about this so this temporal difference error is basically telling you what is the expected return by taking action t plus so one time step action subtracted from your previous expected uh, uh, return from the previous time step. And that's basically what this delta t is encoding. And we are using this as a third factor or modulation factor, uh, which goes in here in order to update our weights. Okay. So of course I've shown it only for uij, but you can do this uh, very simply for all the other parameters, so the bias and other weights of the dynamic Boltzmann machine. So how does a typical learning rule or an online learning procedure for this kind of a SASA algorithm looks like? So what you would essentially do is have a repetitive process like this. So at every point in time, you choose the next action XA 
at time t plus 1 using this or your policy. So in our case, this is a Boltzmann policy. So using that policy, you choose the next action. You take that action to obtain a new observation state xz at time t plus 1 and some new reward. Then you evaluate your q action value function using the energy function of dibm. So this one basically is the energy function associated with this new action that you have taken. Once you get that, you can cache that value and then update a temporal difference error. So this TD error depends on this new up evaluated values that comes from the energy function associated with this new action that you have taken, subtracted from the previous value. And then you use this temporal difference error as we have seen in the previous slide in order to update all the network parameters. Once you do that, you cache this new observation and the action values along with all the state of your eligibility traces. So eligibility trace is basically this alpha ij, beta ij and gamma ij terms in dynamic Boltzmann machine. Once you do that, you can now update the eligibility traces and the FIFO queues in your network and repeat this process continuously. So at every point in time, you're basically acting using a, a Boltzmann exploration policy and then using the energy of dynamic Boltzmann machine to approximate a Q action value function and hoping that that gets better and better over time or your TD error gets lower and lower over time such that you achieve uh, the optimal policy. So another form of learning that can be done uh, which works quite well in practice is called policy gradient reinforcement learning. So in this case, we do not use a, a value function or a action value function but we basically directly optimize what we are interested in. What we are interested in is to learn a policy which basically uh, gives us our, or maximizes our expected return over time. And what we are going to do in a policy gradient reinforcement learning approach is we are going to learn the parameters theta associated with this policy directly. It's good to understand one particular term called uh, advantage function. So this advantage function associated with your state and action is given by the difference between your action value function q and your value function v of theta, which basically tells you how much value you have gained by taking an action a in state s. So policy gradient methods basically update this policy pa parameters to follow the gradient of this average reward. So basically uh, doing delta j of theta with respect to theta is uh, we will update the parameters of, of the model. Uh, in order to do that, we can use the policy gradient theorem, which tells us that this gradient is equal to the expectation of your advantage function multiplied by the gradient of your gradient of your log of your uh, uh, policy. So this pi is basically this policy that we are using. So for example, if you use a Boltzmann exploration policy, that would be your pi. And you can essentially, by taking this expectation, you can uh, get the gradient of this uh, policy with respect to the parameters of your model. One quite nice form to kind of instead of doing a vanilla gradient, you can also use something called a natural policy gradient, uh, which comes out in this form. So uh, for the, na uh, the natural policy gradient can be written as the product of your inverse uh, um, Fisher information matrix multiplied by the gradient of g of theta. And if you approximate this action value, uh, this advantage function say with some parameters uh, or model with some parameters w uh, doing this natural policy gradient is equivalent to doing gradient descent along the direction of this parameters w okay so it'll become clear here so basically this allows us to do something called an actor critic um, gradient method so our actor created policy gradient method wherein this advantage function is in general not known to us. So we are going to approximate this advantage function by some uh, model whose parameters are w. And the critic is basically what is going to tell us how good or bad these uh, my policies are. So this critic evaluates the value associated with states and actions by approximating this advantage function. Okay. So you could either, uh, uh, approx the critic could either approximate your advantage function or it could uh, approximate your Q action value function or even the value function. Basically, it tells you how good or bad was the policy that you acted upon. The actor updates the policy parameters based on what the critic tells you. So based on this critic, we can get an estimate of a temporal difference error. And those temporal difference error is going to allow us to update the policy parameters using an actor network. In case of natural policy gradient, 
this actor is basically going to update the parameters of this model in the direction of the parameters that you have got from the critic. Okay, so we, which is basically what we saw here. So this W represents the parameters of this critic network. Okay, so this is also something very nice. So this uh, approximate advantage function can be represented in terms of an approximate action value function Q. So because uh, we have less time, I will not go into the details of this. So this was shown by an algorithm called ECNAC or energy-based Q uh, natural actor critic learning, wherein this advantage function can be written out in this form, wherein so, you, you, so this advantage function can be approximated by a Q action value function parameter, parameterized by parameters W uh, subtracted from the expectation of A tilde, where A tilde are all the other actions in your model. Essentially what this means is, is that it is sufficient to approximate the Q action value function by a linear function approximator uh, given by phi of theta multiplied by W. So W is basically the uh, parameters of this linear function approximator. So you could do this uh, again, so you could write this down in, in an algorithmic form. So at every point in time, so you initially start off with complete uh, random parameterization. So you again, you choose your action from some policy. So this policy typically would be a Boltzmann policy that we will use. For at each point in time, you now get a reward at time t plus one based on the action that you have taken. You get a, a state uh, at time t plus one by sampling from this probability distribution of your state and actions. You take the next action. You now what we're going to do is that we're going to update something called the J. So J is basically an uh, expected, uh, it's an average reward term. So J of theta, uh, t plus one basically gives you uh, how your reward changes on average. Delta T is basically again your temporal difference error. So this temporal difference error now has an additional term. So along with the reward that you get, you subtract this estimated J, so the average reward, plus this linear approximation of your Q action value function. Once you get this linear approximation, so you basically, you can up update the W parameters. So this is the parameters of a critic network. So these parameters can be updated using a product of your temporal difference error and this function approximator. Once you get that, you can update the policy parameters or the actor network parameters following the natural gradient, which essentially means in the direction of the gradient of uh, these parameters. Okay. And this works quite well in practice. So this allows us to, so this similar method of uh, actor critic learning allows us to do the same thing using a dyna dynamic Boltzmann machine formulation. So now we are going to essentially have two separate network. One is an actor network and a critic network. And using, an, uh, so the critic is going to get parameterized by W, which estimates the Q action value function at, uh, uh, so, uh, using a linear function approximator, which comes from the energy of dynamic Boltzmann machine. And the actor is going to get updated at every point in time, following the natural gradient in the direction of its parameters, W. Okay. Okay, so let me go through some examples uh, in order to essentially see how this works in uh, well in practice. Uh, so this is quite simple. Okay, let me just, we can go through this quite uh, quickly. So this is a, a, one of the very earliest uh, uh, problems of a, kind of a T junction uh, uh, or a T maze task which is typically uh, partially observable. So this is basically a, a binary uh, learning task. So your observations are three bit encoded. Your actions have a one of an encoding. So at every point in time, your agent can take any of four actions in north, south, east, west. Uh, the task is that at the beginning, you get uh, some signal. So that's this signal tells you when you reach the T junction, whether you should move either to the left direction or to the right direction. And afterwards, you do not get the signal anymore. So during the corridor, you get some binary representation given by 101. So when you come to the T junction, you need to recall what you had seen at the starting point in order to move to the correct direction, either to the left side or the right side. And that's essentially why you would require some form of memory. And in this task, you can compare it against some of the historical work like RL LSTM. Uh, so using a, a, a long short term memory network with some 10 hidden units. Uh, so very less number of hidden units or a simple RNN. And as we can see that the dynamic Boson machine saucer network works quite well. So even when you generalize across the size of the network, so here in this case, at every episode, you're changing the size or the length of the uh, corridor. So you start with say 10 
step length of the corridor and you slowly keep increasing the length, uh, the success rate of course falls down depending on the model complexity, but it works quite well and robustly across uh, the PomDB task. And we'll see that you can actually, so the we have LSTMs have been combined with uh, convolution neural networks in, a, in order to get something called a deep Q network uh, with or a deep recurrent Q network that works quite well with POMDP models. We can do something similar with Dysasa network. We'll see this later on. Okay, I'll skip over this in the interest of time. Um, okay, we can, so this is, uh, or let me just say quickly. So basically this is a task wherein you have a stochastic policy task. So at every point in time, you basically have a cyclic policy that you want to learn. You don't have any observed states. All the states are unobserved. And what you have is basically actions. So these actions are n bit uh, encoded. That means if you have five bit actions, you typically have two to the power of five uh, possible action state space. So not very large, but quite large. And what you want to learn is the cyclic policy. So only when you are in this state, you receive a reward of 10 if you move to this state. Any other state will not give you a reward. Once again, if you are in this state, k plus 1 at state, only when your actions are represented by this encoding, you receive a reward of 10 and come back to this state. And the idea is that you want to keep cycling. So you want to learn the cyclic policy. And once again here, uh, using a policy gradient algorithm, lets you reach the maximum reward of 10 for this kind of a BoundDB problem. Whereas in case of uh, RBM, so if you directly use uh, a restricted Boltzmann machine which does not have memory, it treats both of these uh, states as independent. As a result, it reaches a maximum reward of 10 by 2, which is 5 in this case. Okay, let me just skip this. All right. So as I mentioned, you can combine uh, this kind of a dynamic uh, Boltzmann machine SASA network in combination with a... Uh, multi-layered or a deep convolutional neural network, which gives you a much better feature representation. So this one is, of course, a nonlinear network, but our DICARSA is still a linear network. So what we do in this case is that you can now use uh, inputs, which are basically raw pixel data, as has been used with convolutional neural networks, which gives you a feature representation of those pixel images. Then you pass it through some ReLU layer. So this basically gives you ReLU activations, so between zeros and ones, and that acts as the observation input to your Dysasa network. So Dysasa now basically takes input which is of the ReLU. Along with that, it takes input the action dimension. So for example, if you have a binary task, uh, whatever is your dimensionality or action, those many nodes you would require in your Dysasa network. And the idea is that this Dysasa network learns without backpropagation as you have seen. So this one basically learns only in the forward direction. But we are going to use the same temporal difference error to propagate it backwards through the convolutional neural network to update the weights of the convolutional neural networks. With this, you can uh, apply this kind of energy-based learning for things like uh, Atari games, uh, uh, for example, uh, a game of Pong. And it works. Uh, so in this case, we are comparing this deep dye salsa with a standard DQN, so this is not an energy-based model, directly using a convolutional neural network, and it works similarly, so not much difference between the performance. Of course, in this case, it's a fully observable scenario, so at every point in time, the agent is seeing the entire screen. However, things become interesting if you make the task slightly dif different, so if you make it partially observable. So this case is for a flickering pong, so what you do is that at each time step, you essentially obscure the entire screen. So you make the screen completely black with some given probability, say p is equal to 0 0.5. So in this case, the agent has to recall what it had seen in the past states in order to take an action. Here, of course, if you directly use a DQN network, it performs quite badly as compared to uh, the deep dye Sasa network, mainly because of the fact that now you have access. So the convolution neural network is now connected with a dynamic Boltzmann machine network which supplies you the memory of what you have seen in the past in order to take the future action. Of course, you can use another approach. So you can use an additional record and neural network like an LSTM in combination with this uh, DQN, and that also performs quite well. So there's not much difference between these two networks performance. Uh, 
But in practice, because there is no backpropagation through time in a DIBM network, the deep Dysasa network performs much faster in an online setting as compared to a DRQN model. Because in this case, you need to perform backpropagation through time through this uh, uh, multi-layered LSTM network. Okay, so I'll go quickly through this segment. So we, just a few more slides. So till now, what we have seen is application of this Dysarsa or uh, energy-based model for binary action tasks. So even in uh, Atari, you had basically or, or discrete actions, but you can also apply these to continuous actions. And one straightforward, a simple solution is to use a Gaussian policy. So now instead of using a Boltzmann policy where you would have to, where you have this normalization term, which wherein you need to sum over all possible actions, you can use a, a Gaussian policy wherein the mean of this Gaussian is given by a linear combination of your state features. And then you use a suitable energy-based function approximator for this, uh, for this kind of an energy-based model. And one such function approximator happens to be this Gaussian DIBM, which also had this uh, uh, Gaussian uh, distribution assumption. Uh, so to show you some, some results uh, with this such kind of a continuous problem. So this is a much more high dimensional problem as you would have seen with uh, Reacher task. So in this case, we have a multi -deg degree of freedom robot arm. So this is a UR5 robot arm, which is basically has seven degrees of freedom. The task is that you're using Kinect data directly. So in this case, the robot has not been given the actual position information where this uh, object is located. So you, you're using a convolution neural network to estimate the position, the X, Y position of this object directly from Kinect data, and then using an energy-based reinforcement learning in order to move or learn a, a continuous policy of how to move the robot arm. You can also do more interesting things. So you can actually learn, you can parallelize this very well. So even without using, so similar to uh, asynchronous reinforcement learning methods, you can learn, run multiple agents in parallel that gives you not only significant speed up, but also the learning performance increases. So here again, we are using this continuous policy gradient method, wherein the system is learning. So multiple agents is running in parallel where it needs to avoid the green objects while learning to reach these targets it also works quite well. So once again, these tasks are significantly more difficult as compared to a two degree of freedom uh, reach a task. But in this case, you have a much more high dimensional problem. Okay. So again, this is model free. So no model uh, or dynamics information is given to our reinforcement learning approximator. So finally, I just wanted to point out uh, towards this uh, very recent work, which is quite nice. And this is called Deep Energy-Based Policies for Continuous Control. Uh, so this is a work from Peter Rebel and Sergey Levin's group uh, published in the recent ICML conference, where they basically use a maximum entropy formulation of the policy. So the optimal policy pi is now not only you're uh, basically maximizing the expected uh, re reward over time, but it's also maximizing the entropy associated with your policy. Uh, this has, there has been a lot of work in the past. So this has been kind of surveyed previously. It's called known as maximum entropy uh, formulation of reinforcement learning, which has been used widely in uh, optimal control problems. Once again, you can formulate this. So this gives you a notion of your uh, optimal policy, but you can use the policy uh, as an energy-based formulation, wherein you have the policy is proportional to some uh, exponential, uh, given by this uh, Q action value function, what they call a soft act action value function. So the soft action value function basically is very similar to what you've seen in the past, but now it has this additional term, um, which is the entropy. So this, the uh, optimal Q uh, so soft action value function can be given by the reward at time T plus your expectation over uh, for the future states uh, given by the reward at, at your future <laughs> states so the future rewards, as well as your, uh, the entropy associated with your policy. Uh, with this, they showed that learning is quite efficient. So you can learn, so compared to other methods like deep deterministic policy gradient methods, uh, this method significantly outperforms those methods uh, when they tried out problems like, um, uh, basically uh, similar to the reacher task that you've seen, so robotic task, um, 
within uh, the OpenAI gym kind of uh, uh, environment. Okay, so the main difference uh, thing to keep in mind is uh, so in basically in summary is that um, the energy based RL with Boltzmann exploration is also very similar to uh, a maximum entropy formulation. However, in the Boltzmann exploration policy, you essentially greedily maximize the entropy at each time step. So at every time step, you're greedily maximizing your entropy. You're not considering the entropy associated with all possible actions of your trajectory. Uh, that is something that is done in this uh, deep energy based uh, policy method and that's the reason it's quite nice. So by introducing this formulation in your policy itself, you now not only consider the entropy associated with your cu current time step action, but you have a much more efficient exploration. So you consider the entropy associated with all possible actions. So what we have seen in this segment is that you can use energy based RL uh, for uh, as a function approximator for reinforcement learning. Typically, use, you can use a restricted Boltzmann machine uh, and that is known as a free energy based uh, SASA. You can get more improved performance if you direct, if you use a policy gradient method like actor critic. So you can have an actor critic formulation for such energy based reinforcement learning methods. We have also seen that uh, dynamic Boltzmann machine energy formulation allows you to deal with partially observable decision making problems, both in discrete as well as continuous uh, actions or continuous problems. And finally, we have slightly discussed that uh, the recent formulation of deep energy based policies uh, with a maximum entropy formulation allows you even more efficient exploration. So I'll just summarize this entire tutorial. So throughout the day, what we have seen is that you can use Boltzmann machines. Uh, so we have basically gone through the historical perspective of Boltzmann machines and energy based models. Uh, we have seen formulations like restricted Boltzmann machines that allow, essentially do not have connections between hidden to hidden and visible to visible, which allows you to uh, calculate the data dependent expectation in a tractable manner, which was not possible in the original Boltzmann machines. Uh, we have seen that you can do temporal sequence prediction problems also with this kind of energy based models, whereas the new formulation of dynamic Boltzmann machine allows you to do this in constant time without requiring back propagation through time. We have seen that energy based models can also be used for reinforcement learning. And finally, uh, we would like to mention that uh, we will be open sourcing a pretty, uh, in the next few days uh, a Python library for dynamic Boltzmann machines. So many of the formulations that you have seen for a generative model modeling as well as time series prediction and reinforcement learning. Uh, and so stay tuned. Uh, please keep a look at our tutorial web page wherein you would see more update on you know um, when this is getting open source. So most it, it may be using this uh, uh, link or it might change. So but the exact uh, link will appear from our tutorial web page. Uh, but if you are interested more, we are happy to talk to you offline. So you can, if you want to discuss more about the open source uh, library, we can, even before it gets open source in the public, we can talk about it offline. Thank you. Do we have uh, questions? Uh, we're going to be uh, here to, uh, today and during the whole period of the conference, so uh, please uh, talk to me if you have any interest in the work. Thank you very much. Thank you.